Welcome to Heavens Declare. I'm Jim Burr, sharing more of the heavens. Um, today, uh, actually, we were going to talk about the star of Bethlehem. Uh, we've got a, in our series, sometimes we run out of time and um, we don't able to finish all the pictures we wanted to share. So I guess you could call this maybe astronomy a la carte because we're going to hit several different subjects. And, uh, and maybe that's not unusual because I know I a lot of times get off on bunny trails anyway. But we're going to talk about the Star of Bethlehem. We're going to talk about, you know, the Bible talks about the Pleiades. In, uh, in Job 38, 31, and 32, it talks about several things in the heavens. Uh, and it was a question God asked Job. He had 80-some questions for Job, you know. Um, where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? But God asked Job, uh, can you bind the Pleiades? Can you loose the belts of Orion? Can you bring forth a Meseroth in its season? Can you guide Arcturus with its suns? Now, this is, this is an amazing, amazing scripture, uh, an amazing insight there into the heavens. Because first off, God said, can you bind the Pleiades? Well, the Pleiades, we call them the seven sisters. Uh, we see seven stars with the naked eye. There's actually about 500 in the Pleiades group. And uh, they are moving to the east at 90,000 mi miles an hour, bound together. Now, if you watched our other programs, you have seen stars going every direction uh, in the video clips that we've had. And yet the Pleiades are bound together. And that was kind of interesting. God said, can you bind the Pleiades? Uh, and they're moving to the east at 90,000 miles an hour. And when I was first uh, studying astronomy, and I thought, man, I better look at them this week. Do you know where the Pleiades are going to be next year? You know, multiply 90,000 you know, miles an hour times 24 hours a day times 365. And as I continued to study, I discovered it takes 33,000 years for the Pleiades to move the distance of the moon, like across the moon in the sky. So uh, I'd like to show you a, a picture of the Pleiades. And... Uh, uh, there they are, the seven sisters, beautiful, beautiful uh, star scene. And the, the, the Pleiades have clouds around them. We call it nebulosity. Now, there's gaseous clouds around the Pleiades. Uh, but the interesting thing is God said, can you bind them? And we now know that there's actually uh, 500 stars there bound together, moving to the east, actually towards Orion. The Pleiades are located um, just to the west of Orion in the constellation of Taurus, uh, Taurus the bull. Uh, and so um, the scripture says, can you loose the belts of Orion or the, the bands of Orion? Some, trans some uh, translations would say the bands. Uh, and uh, can you guide Arcturus uh, and bring forth Meseroth? The, that's the, if you look in your margin of your Bible, you see that's the signs of the zodiac. Can you, Job, can you bring around the, the signs of the zodiac? Now, I should mention, um, Christians should not get involved in, a, in astrology. Uh, there's a big difference between astronomy and astrology. And uh, I, astrology, I believe, is uh, a perversion by the devil uh, to have people look at their stars and think the stars have something to do with their life. And it's quite popular. No, it's in the newspapers all the time. What's your sign? And actually, the signs are off a whole constellation. They haven't even caught up. Uh, with the precession of the equinox. The Earth has a wobble, and uh, we call it the precession of the equinox. The Earth, like a top, is spinning. It has a 26,000-year wobble, and so the constellations are changing over time. In fact, at the time of Christ, the Southern Cross was visible in uh, the Northern Hemisphere, which it's not today. But we want to go, uh, we'll pick up the belts of Orion, uh, but first let's talk about Arcturus. Now, Arcturus is uh, God said to, to Job, can you guide Arcturus? We now know Arcturus is a runaway star. Arctur Arcturus is traveling through our galaxy. Uh, it's a runaway star doing about 400,000 miles an hour through our galaxy. Astronomers have been saying for, uh, since I've been reading, 20, 30 years, Arcturus may just leave the galaxy. And uh, new articles have come out recently uh, with the question, did another galaxy give us Arcturus? So astronomers are thinking this runaway star may have come from another galaxy, traveling through our galaxy, may just leave our galaxy. And when you look at the galaxy and you realize that 
Uh, Arcturus is traveling through there at 400,000 miles an hour. Here's, here's a, an example of a galaxy. And hasn't yet collided with another star. That's, uh, that's pretty amazing. But what's even more amazing, if you read Job, you know, God said to Job, can you guide Arcturus with its suns? If you Google Arcturan group, you will discover that Arcturus has 52 little stars traveling through the galaxy with it. And uh, it's fun to see the scripture being played out in the heavens uh, scientifically, you know, when, and accurately when uh, so many other religions taught. There's one that taught that there are people living on the sun, people living on the moon. Uh, there was, you know, five, five villages on the moon and seven villages on the sun and describes the people and so forth. And they used to think the earth was supported on the back of turtles and elephants, you know, and Charles Atlas was holding the earth up and, and God hangs the earth on nothing. So uh, Arcturus, a runaway star, with traveling through space with its 52, uh, 52 suns. The rest of that scripture is uh, talking about Orion, and it says, can you loose the belts or the bands of Orion? And lo and behold, we've discovered there are three stars that have left the belt of Orion at a high speed. And I'll share that graphic with you next. Uh, and you see the belt uh, there in the very center. Those three stars would be the belt stars of Orion. And these stars have traveled to completely other constellations at very high speeds. They've, astronomers have traced them back to the belt of Orion. And so I just wanted to share that with you. Uh, once again, the Bible is, uh, is accurate. Now, as we move along, there's a very interesting nebula. Now, there are basically four types of nebulae in the sky. We have nebulae that are, they glow because they're hot. We see them because they're, glow, they're hot and they're glowing. Nebulae that glow because they're embedded with bright stars. There's nebulae like the Horsehead Nebula, which we have seen in the past here. And uh, then we have these uh, supernova eruptions, which we call planetary nebula because we, as we look at them in a telescope, we see a disk rather than a pinpoint of light. And uh, I remember the first time I discovered the picture, the next picture we're going to have up, it's called the Witch's Head Nebula. And, and you see it, you certainly see the picture. There's an arrow pointing to the nose, uh, arrow pointing to the mouth of the witch. And uh, well, the first time I discovered this years ago, I'm saying, did God do this? Uh, or did it just happen? Now, if God placed the witches, when I, when I see a picture of a witch, I think of something connected with Satan. Um, and so in my mind, I'm thinking, okay, there's 88 places this could be, 88 constellations in the heavens. Uh, would there be a message with the witch's head nebula? And so I'm thinking something connected with Satan. So I'm thinking, well, uh, he was the dragon. Would it be in Draco the dragon? He was a roaring lion. Would it be in Leo the lion? Uh, he was a snake. Would it be in serpents? The constellation of serpents, which is a snake. And there's another snake, Hydra. And I'm going through my mind trying to think of where the witch would be. And I could not even find the best place for the witch. You know where the witch is? In the lake of fire. Aridness, the lake of fire. The witch is located two and a half degrees west of Rigel. Rigel now is the uh, westerly most uh, foot star in Orion. And the witch is said, now is in Aridness, the river of fire or the lake of fire prepared for Satan and his angels. I was so excited. I mean, I was just like praising the Lord. I called my wife. Guess what? <laughs> Guess what? Um, I saw a message in that picture. Now, uh, you know, there are 88 constellations where it could be, but it was in an area that had a message for us. Well, the lake of fire was prepared for Satan and his angels. And uh, I want to go uh, to the uh, next graphic, and uh, you will see uh, Orion, you'll see a lake of fire there. You see the, the river of fire coming out of the bottom. You see Taurus, which is a constellation, Taurus the bull. And uh, you see Orion uh, to the left. And uh, he's holding a lion skin up. At the top, you see a shepherd with uh, the lambs in the, in, the, in, the, in the lap of the shepherd. Now, um, the 
There was a woman who was uh, studying this. Uh, Frances Rulliston was studying. She was an authority in ancient languages, and she began studying star names in ancient languages. We have the star names that have come down uh, from all, re you know, ancient history, um, over 100, 150 star names. And in ancient languages, every name had a meaning. If your name was Philip, it meant lover of horses. If it was Joshua, uh, Joshua it meant Jehovah is my God. If it was Esau, it meant Harry. So in Bible times, uh, in those olden times, names had meanings. Francis Rulison started looking at star names in ancient languages, and she began to see the story of salvation told in the constellations. And uh, what she's uh, studying the stars, the stars in Taurus, the, the bull, she saw uh, the judgment, the judgment of God. And she sees in Orion a type of Christ. And in a lion's skin, Satan defeated uh, and then in Ariga, the saints sitting in the lap of the shepherd. And uh, we might go back to that slide again, take another look at it, and you'll see that Orion, is a, she's saying, is a representation of Christ. He's holding up a lion's skin that, which is about to be dropped into the lake of fire. Now, if you go home, and in fact, we have scripture on the screen there. They're suggesting, uh, Francis never wrote a book. Uh, she made lots of notes, and many others have come along and written uh, books about the story of salvation in the heavens. But uh, she or they are suggesting Isaiah 40, 11 is what we're looking at at the top of the picture there, where it says, He shall feed his flock like a shepherd. He shall gather the lambs in his arms and carry them in his bosom, and shall gently lead those who are with young. And then we have Daniel 7, where it says a fiery stream issued. Okay, you see the fiery stream there, issued and came uh, forth before him. And 10,000 times 10,000 stood before him. The judgment was set and the books were opened, Daniel 7. And so what they're suggesting is this is, a, this is the scene, a judgment scene at the very end of time. Now, if you go home and read your National Geographics, you're, you're going to see Orion has a bow. He's got a bow and an arrow. He's going to shoot the bow, uh, Taurus. And, uh, but the, uh, if you look at the star charts that astronomers use, and uh, I think we may have that graphic up, actually the old star charts show a lion's skin. In Orion is holding up a lion's skin about to be dropped into the lake of fire. And... Uh, uh, if you look up at the upper right there, you'll see uh, it says lion skin up near the right-hand corner, a lion skin. So the ancient star charts actually show a lion skin there and uh, about to be dropped into the lake of fire. Well, uh, I thought I would share a few more pictures with you on the story of salvation told in the constellations. And some of these you go like, <laughs> how did we miss it? Particularly the last one when you see Orion, you see the uh, the bull and, and the saints in the lap of the shepherd and the judgment and all of, all of that. We have another graphic which shows Virgo, the uh, virgin, uh, the mother of Christ. And uh, in her hand, she has a stalk of corn in one hand and she has a branch in the other. Christ was the seed of the woman. He was also known as the branch. Above that, you see Comrade Bernice with the Christ child in her lap. Now this is a, a more an original picture, but if you go back uh, to the ancient ones, uh, you'll, you'll see the virgin with a child. Today, you see a woman's wig there, and that's a story about, had to do with Ptolemy, and uh, it's kind of a long story I won't go into, but that has changed, and some of these we know have been changed. So you probably can't make all the constellations stand on all four, but as I look at it, I see, begin to see the story of salvation. Uh, if we could go back to that graphic, you will also see Booties. Now, Booties is a shepherd. You see he has a sickle in one hand. He has a staff in the other. And that's a, a symbol of Christ, who is a good shepherd, came with a staff, and he has a sickle. At the end, he comes to the harvest with a sickle. And then if you go down below, you see Centaurus. And the legend is that Centaurus was immortal. He voluntarily laid his life down. And you see the two natures of Christ there in Centaurus. And then we have, I think, one more graphic, and uh, that has to do with Ophiuchus. Ophiuchus is a mighty man. He's doing battle with the serpent there. The serpent is trying to seize the crown that Adam and Eve lost, and uh, the scorpion right below that is being crushed. Uh, his head is being crushed. 
Genesis 3.15 says, I put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shall bruise his heel. Uh, so we see the battle between Christ and Satan there. Uh, scorpion representing, they're saying, is representing Satan, about to be crushed by the foot of Christ. And then above that we see uh, the constellation of Hercules, again, which is a representation of Christ, and he's known as the man upon his knees. So... From here, we're going to turn and talk about the Star of Bethlehem. Now, movies have been written, books have been written, uh, you know, all kinds of speculation, people running the computers backwards. Now, we've got computers, you know, we can run computers backwards. We can find anything. I mean, you can take Halley's Comet and you can run it for 2,000 years forward or backward, and you can find out what was in the sky at any particular time. Uh, that you want on these computers. And so people have run it back and forth trying to figure out what was it the, the Star of Bethlehem, thinking that it was some natural event, thinking it was a comet. Maybe it was a conjunction of Venus and you know, the bright planets. Uh, maybe it was a supernova explosion. And uh, so all kinds of speculation. There's one video that's been out. The guy has done an unbelievable research about the Star of Bethlehem, but he does not have it figured out. He says it was the conjunction of Saturn and Regulus, the star in Leo, the bright bottom star in Leo, and that we, we know as the Earth goes around, you know, everything moves to the west at one degree. But by the rotation of the Earth, all of a sudden some stars appear to go backward for a few months. And he traced that back to Saturn and Regulus, and Saturn is every day is moving one degree, and then all of a sudden it stops and it starts moving backwards because of the rotation of the Earth. And he said that was the star of Bethlehem that led the wise men. Well, folks, let me tell you, if you know how stars move in the sky, if you have a map, uh, and if you have your Bible, I will show you five problems. Anybody who says it was a comet, it was a conjunction, it was a, a supernova, uh, has got problems. There's five basic problems. It could not have been a natural event. And if I'll illustrate that, and it's going to be so clear, I think, if you know how the stars move in the sky, if you have a Bible, and if you have a map, here's the deal. We know that the stars rise in the east and set in the west. I'm going to use this for a telescope because it's much lighter to move than that one behind me. Uh, so we basically would look at, in the east, we'll look at a star rising through the night, and then it sets in the west. During the day, it's down towards China. We basically put a motor on the telescope. We put a 24-hour clock, 24-hour clock on the telescope. So this thing is going to go around in like 24 hours. So we would put it on a star. No matter where we go in the sky, it makes no difference. Uh, it's, we, we, we rotate this with the north star, the north pole of the Earth, the rotation of the Earth. So basically, we put a 24-hour clock motor that's going to line up this with the north star and follow any star in the sky throughout the night. Now, there's only one star that's stationary, and that's the north star. And all night long, it's there. And so a telescope would simply, with this motor, would simply rotate. So stars rise in the east, they set in the west, OK? We put a 24-hour clock motor on a telescope. And what is so cool, uh, during the day time, our star is down by China. This telescope is still pointing towards the star. And we put a motor on here, and this will never move. The telescope never moves, even though it's got a 24-hour motor on it. Basically, it allows and permits the Earth to turn underneath the telescope. So when we build the telescope, we put a 24-hour clock motor, we line it on the North Star, and it's never going to move. Even though during the day it's pointed towards China, it stood still. It's just the Earth turned underneath it. Are you with me? Are you following me? Is that cool? Well, then tomorrow night when the star's right, here we are within one degree. Stars only move one degree a day. So uh, the next night, the clock is going to be just within one degree of that star. And again, as it rotates. So it's a, uh, we just put a 24-hour clock on our telescope, line it up with the North Star. It never moves, but the Earth is going to rotate underneath it. And that's how we follow the stars, how we track the stars with a telescope. So now, if we look at our Bible, and uh, uh, we look at the uh, star of Bethlehem, and the, uh, if we look at Matthew, it says, 
that the wise men had seen his star and they came to Jerusalem. Uh, we have seen his star in the east. No problem. That's, that's cool. Whether they were in the east or the west and the star was in the east or they were in the east, it makes no difference. Because if you look at the map, uh, in fact, let's, uh, okay, let's just go to that map, uh, I think, in the next, uh, next graphic. Uh, and so coming from the east, no problem. They come to Jerusalem. And now there's basically a problem because the star disappears. They get to Jerusalem. You see the arrow there from the right. They get to Jerusalem. The star disappears. Well, stars don't disappear. Comets don't disappear. Supernovas don't disappear. Conjunctions don't disappear. Because they get to Jerusalem. They say, we've seen a star in the east. We come to worship him. And the star disappears. So they inquire, where is he to be born king of the Jews? And they're told they need to go to Bethlehem. Now, you'll see on the map, you'll notice that Bethlehem is south. So we got a problem because there's nothing in the sky that makes left turns. Nothing in the sky, the comets, the conjunctions, the supernovas, none of them will make a left turn, but the star of Bethlehem did make a left turn to lead them down to Bethlehem. Now the next problem, so that's two problems. The third problem is the Bible said the star came and went before them. So here we see the star getting Jerusalem, the star stops, they make a left turn, the star appears again, and now they start south towards Bethlehem. Well, the next problem is you cannot get to Bethlehem. You cannot get south by following a star because the star is going to move. You're going to end up in the west following a star because of the rotation of the earth. The stars don't stay in the south all night long. They're moving gradually, would take you off course. So if it was, again, if it was a conjunction, if it was a, 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 a conjunction of the planets, if it was a, a supernova, if it was a comet, it was any event, natural event in the and the Bible could not get you to Bethlehem because you're going to end up in the west instead of going south. Like I said, you need a map to see that. That's four problems, okay? The star, no problem getting to Jerusalem, but the star stopped. That's the first problem. Second star, the star made, star made a left turn. That's the second problem. The third problem, the star started up again. It came and went before them. Fourth problem, you can't get south by following a star. Fifth problem, the Bible says the star came and stood over the manger. Now, as I said, there's no stars that stop there moving all night long except the North Star, and we're going south. So it had to be a miracle of God. It was uh, obviously probably a band of angels because the Bible says suddenly there was uh, with him the whole heavenly host. And, uh, and so anybody who tells you, well, I have a book, The Supernova of Bethlehem, you know, The Comet of Bethlehem, The Conjunction, uh, it had to be a miracle of God because there's nothing in the sky that would explain that. And I know there's a lot of people are going to, I think, appreciate this because um, of all the talk about uh, the Star of Bethlehem. Um, we're going to change course a little bit and talk about last day events. In, uh, in Matthew 24, verse 6, we're told, For nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. And there will be famines and pestilence and earthquakes in various places. But the end is not yet. But the end is not yet. And if we continue on in Matthew 24, verse 14, it says, And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world for a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. So we see the prophecies. We see all these events happening. Uh, but it isn't yet. The end is not yet until the gospel goes. And what I'm so excited about, I've seen the gospel go like wildfire. It's unbelievable how the gospel is going. Um, and uh, we also see another prophecy of the end time would be uh, Daniel 12, 14, 4, which it says, But thou, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book to the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge will be increased. Yes, it is definitely being increased like uh, crazy with the media, with what's happening. And even in 3ABN on nine satellites going around the world in, in, many, in a more, many channels, actually. Um, and what I see is God fulfilling this prophecy. The gospel will be preached. There is a man who's put up over 200 radio stations. Uh, 
from Radio 74. Life Talk Radio has 99 stations. You know, Hope TV is on 13 full-time channels. They're carried on Dish and Direct, which has 20 million viewers. 3ABN is carried on uh, Dish, which, is car which has 14 mi uh, million uh, viewers. 3ABN has world satellite coverage. They've got like 164 TV stations. They've got like 400 channels in North America. And uh, we have 3 Ali being Latino, that's just on 400 million cable companies, being 400 million people subscribing. Um, and Doug Batchelor's heard over like 1,000 times a week. It is written, it's on 7,700 7, channels in 143 countries. Uh, Adventist World Radio is just totally amazing. They had last year 5.8 billion downloads of our sermons on Adventist World Radio. And the last I heard this last August, they actually had 11 million people a year. 11 million people a year were downloading their, a day, 11 million a day downloading their sermons. They had 8.5 billion last year, but 11 million a day. The gospel is going like wildfire, and that prophecy tells us that when the gospel will be preached, then the end will come. And I just see that happening. It's just so amazing to see what God is doing because you realize this church has a message that others do not have. There are people out there who think once saved, always saved. Walk the, you know, walk the aisle, pray the sinner's prayer. You're in. You're going to heaven. Uh, and that's not true, folks. Uh, because Jesus comes, he says, there's people that think they're Christians, but they don't know Jesus. He says, depart from me, I never knew you. And uh, we have a message, you see, about once saved, the proper message, the correct message, about once saved, always saved, about ever burning hell. God's not burning people forever in hell. And we have the uh, Sabbath, uh, you know, that the people need to hear about the Sabbath. He's once saved, always saved. Uh, truths from the Word of God that are not proclaimed throughout the world, but only by this message, this channel, this network. And so we want to thank you. Boy, our time just goes so fast. Now, thank you for watching Heavens Declare. Uh, we just enjoy sharing the heavens with you and the beautiful things God has created. And certainly the heavens do declare the glory of God. We want to uh, invite you to join us again next week as we explore more of the heavens. Thank you for watching.